Well, good morning. I'm Bob Cabana, the director here at the Kennedy Space Center. It's my pleasure to welcome you here today for this announcement. As we celebrate the first 50 years of the Kennedy Space Center this year, uh, we embark on a new journey taking us forward to the next 50 years of exploring space with the announcement of the companies selected for the next phase of development in our commercial crew program. NASA will use the commercial crew program to take our astronauts to the International Space Station later this decade. We are working to transform the center to support a new era of space exploration, modifying and upgrading our facilities for NASA's space launch system. The Orion spacecraft is here right now and the team is processing it for its first flight in 2014. The KSC team has the human capital expertise, unique facilities, and specialized equipment to propel the agency into the next phase of space exploration. And a commercial crew program is a key part of that. It's my pleasure now to turn the stage over to our administrator, Charlie Bolden, for more details on this historic milestone. Charlie? Thanks very much, Bob. Um, I, I want to join Bob and the entire KSC team in celebrating the 50th anniversary of KSC, first of all and just the remarkable uh, contributions of the, the entire Space Coast to uh, America's leadership in space exploration. From the exhilarating days of Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo to the unprecedented 30-year history of Space Shuttle, the road to space has always and always will lead through the great state of Florida. In fact, the Kennedy Space Center is now the launch pad for the next big leap in America's space program, our commercial crew program. This program is a top priority of the Obama administration, and you'll hear from program manager Ed Mango shortly. Two years ago, right here at Kennedy, the president set a goal of sending humans farther into space than we've ever been, to an asteroid in 2025 and Mars in the 2030s. A bipartisan consensus was reached in Washington that the best way to do that was for NASA to acquire services from commercial companies to deliver cargo and crew to the International Space Station. That allows us to concentrate on building America's next generation space exploration system, the Orion spacecraft and the space launch system, the vehicle and rocket that will take American astronauts farther into space than any spacecraft developed for human spaceflight has flown in the 40 years since our astronauts returned from the moon. This dual track exploration strategy is producing tangible results and the teams here in Florida and across the nation are making steady progress. Exactly one month ago, on July 2nd, the first space-bound Orion spacecraft arrived at Kennedy and, as Bob said, is now undergoing final construction and integration in preparations for its initial test flight in 2014. And I'll remind you, that's less than two years from now. This work is expected to support at least 350 Space Coast jobs. The mobile launcher, which will serve as the launch platform for the SLS uh, and which I just had the privilege of touring, will soon be ready to support our deep space exploration efforts. The President has fought to invest close to $1.4 $1 billion in NASA's 21st Century Space Launch Complex and Exploration Ground Systems. This investment will help us upgrade Kennedy's shuttle-era facilities to support multiple users and make this a more, a more flexible launch facility for the future. The crawler transporters that have carried space shuttles and Apollo Saturn V rockets to their launch pads are being upgraded to support the next generation of spacecraft and launch vehicles that will lift off from Kennedy. Last year, Boeing announced they would be taking over one of our former orbiter processing facilities to work on their crew capsule and indicated they would be creating 500 jobs in the process. Recently, Sierra Nevada Corporation successfully completed a captive carry test of its full-scale Dream Chaser orbital crew vehicle, as well as a test of the vehicle's nose landing gear. They have also announced interest in establishing a presence here on the Space Coast, adding to the growing number of commercial companies who find this area an attractive place to do business. In May, SpaceX became the first private company to reach the International Space Station and return its Dragon capsule safely back to Earth, launching right here from Florida and the Space Coast. Our commercial crew and cargo efforts are based on a simple but powerful principle. By investing in American companies, 
and American ingenuity, we're spurring free market competition to give taxpayers more bang for the buck, while enabling NASA to do what we do best, reach for the heavens. We're also making important progress toward ending the outsourcing of American aerospace jobs and bringing them right back here to Florida and other states all across this country. Our commercial crew program has been carefully managed in stages. In 2010, you may remember, during the first phase of our commercial crew initiatives, NASA entered into funded Space Act agreements with five companies to aid in the innovative innovation and development of space transportation subsystem designs and concepts. Those companies were Blue Origin, Boeing, Paragon Space Development Corporation, Sierra Nevada Corporation, and United Launch Alliance. In 2011, during the second phase, we entered into funded Space Act agreements with four companies for the continued development of commercial rockets and spacecraft. Those companies were Blue or are Blue Origin, Boeing, Sierra Nevada, and Space Exploration Technologies, or SpaceX. Today, we're announcing another critical step toward launching our astronauts from U.S. soil on space systems built by American companies. We've selected three companies to develop crew transportation capabilities as a fully integrated system and keep us on track to end the outsourcing of our human spaceflight program. These companies are Sierra Nevada Corporation, Space Exploration Technologies, and the Boeing Company. This is a diverse and dynamic mix of companies, each with unique experiences and proven track records in the aerospace industry. By keeping these three companies in the mix, we not only ensure competition, which is good for the taxpayers, but we're also guaranteeing that we never find ourselves in the situation we're in today, dependent on a sole provider to get our crews to space. For the next 21 months, these partners will perform tests and complete designs. Through this initiative, NASA will help the private sector design and develop the human spaceflight capability that could ultimately lead to the availability of human spaceflight services for both government and commercial customers. We'll also help support the creation of high-paying technology jobs here in Florida and across the country. The ultimate goal of our commercial crew space program is to bring human spaceflight launches right back here to American soil and end the outsourcing of these important jobs. Our U.S. industry partners will help us achieve safe, reliable, and cost-effective access to and from the International Space Station and other destinations of low Earth orbit. Before NASA begins using a commercially developed system to transport our astronauts to and from the ISS, the system must be certified as meeting all of NASA's safety requirements through an entire mission cycle. Certification of commercial systems for NASA transportation missions will be pursued in a future separate phase under the commercial crew program. The innovative spacecraft and rockets proposed by NASA's industry partners will also spur technological innovation and serve as engines of economic growth here in Florida and throughout the nation. Now, let me ask our commercial crew program manager, Ed Mango, to say a few words and give you a little bit more detail than I gave you. Ed? See, thank you, Mr. Bolden. See, first of all, I want to say uh, thank you. Uh, my team and I are extremely excited and ready to go do this. We're ready to continue our partnership with industry and between industry and NASA and in new and innovative ways. I am very confident in the ability and capability of our three partners under ICAP. I believe that we can make great progress with these three partners. What is ICAP? ICAP stands for Commercial Crew Integrated Capability. It is a capability that includes the spacecraft, the launch vehicle, the ground operations, as well as the flight operations. It's an entire mission cycle and doing the design work for that entire mission cycle. So we call it CC ICAP for short. ICAP is also being run under a Space Act Agreement uh, approach uh, that NASA has been able to employ. And what that means to the taxpayer is NASA is not paying 100% of this development cost. We are sharing these costs through a partnership, through NASA and the individual partners. So they are also bringing money to the table. This is a way of leading, this is a way of allowing the United States to lead in the development of new space systems 
that are human capable and then taking those systems for commercial purposes as well as for NASA purposes in the future. As, Charlie, as uh, Mr. Bolton said, there are, there are, <laughs> there are three, uh, three awards. Um, the first is to Sierra Nevada Corporation. Sierra Nevada is going to be getting uh, $212 million if they meet all their milestones. And under the SAA approach, milestones are paid once performance is done. So it's a paid for performance kind of approach. It's again, very good for the taxpayers and very good for NASA. If they meet all the milestones, they can get up to $212.5 million. They've been a very strong partner under CCDF2, and they've been a partner during that period of time, in which they have completed their preliminary design review, and now they're working on their uh, engineering test article, which is a test article of their Dream Chaser, full scale, they're going to use for approach and landing tests. We are very excited to continue our work with Sierra Nevada. Our second partner is SpaceX. SpaceX will be receiving $440 million as they complete their milestones throughout the base period of CC Dev, uh, of ICAP. Uh, as you know, uh, SpaceX uh, is a very progressive partner. We like the way they think, the way they think differently. And it's encouraging my team to think differently as we work with them. They too have been evolving through CC Dev 2. They take their design for cargo, which they flew just a couple months ago, and taking that to evolve it into a crude capability. So they're working on their propulsion systems as well as working on their crew interface systems. And that has gone very well over the last uh, year or so, and we want to continue to work with them very closely. The third partner is Boeing. Boeing will receive $460 million over the course of all the milestones if they meet them. They also are a very sound partner through CCDev2. During CCDev2, they completed a preliminary design review uh, for their spacecraft and also completed a software review preliminary design review for their software. Again, a very uh, hard challenge, and they met those challenges under CCDF2. They also are developing their propulsion system for their abort and their landing system when they land uh, on the ground. All three of, our CCDF, all three of these were CCDF2 partners, and we look forward to working with them again in ICAP. You might ask, what does NASA bring to the table in this commercial uh, uh, partnership? Well, besides the taxpayer money that we will diligently manage, we also bring a team, a team of engineers. We call it a partner integration team, or for short, a pit crew. This particular pit crew we have for each team. And this crew is made up of engineers, a lot from here, right here at the Kennedy Space Center, and also from the Johnson Space Center and many of the other NASA centers. They're NASA engineers. They're NASA safety engineers. They're NASA operations folks, both in the flight regime as well as in the ground regime. We put all these together in this pit crew. They're going to work very closely with these partners. We bring our expertise, our 50 years of human spaceflight experience to the table, not to tell the partner what to do, but to tell them what we have learned over our 50 years and to help them in their design and help them in their risk management trade systems. My team is highly motivated to go do this. And you need a team that, that I was able to uh, handpick so that these folks that are on these pit crews can work in a very innovative way can do things differently than what we've done in the past and still try to make it as safe as possible and meet our requirements in the long run and meet the, re the company's requirements in the short run. A bit later this morning, about 1045 Eastern, there will be a teleconference in which we'll, ha we'll talk a little bit more about the details of the agreements and our partners at that time. You know, before I end, I'd like to take a step back and think about another time in history when the world changed. And that was back in 1927. In 1927, the only way to get across the Atlantic Ocean was through ocean liners. Charles Lindbergh took the courage to figure out a way to fly across the Atlantic Ocean nonstop. And that was, as many, many people call it, a Lindbergh moment, because it made the world smaller. It made the world capable of doing new and different and innovative things. And there's been many Lindbergh moments since that time, but today, the commercial crew program and our industry partners are on a threshold of setting a new set of Lindbergh moments, not just across the Atlantic, but actually to make the world smaller, the planet smaller, and to help commercial industry. Thank you. I think we'll now open it up for questions. Good morning, James Dean from Florida today. Uh, possibly for, for Mr. Mango, just wondered if you could discuss a little bit more um, why this combination of three ultimately uh, was selected in terms of it giving you a diversity of different type of types of uh, spacecraft, uh, a couple launch vehicles, of course. Um, also, how many proposals did you select from? 
see, uh, NASA uses a very strict process for procurement. Um, and so uh, in that process, um, there's many proposals that come in that are, that are evaluated. In this particular case, and you'll hear a lot more about this in the telecon, so you might want to, I encourage you to ask the question again. Uh, but the portfolio that was uh, selected, uh, as you said, is really all about diversity. Diversity of launch vehicles, diversity of spacecraft, uh, and an ability to actually move through these milestones with high confidence that we can meet those milestones. That's how I, you know, as a program, we don't make the selections, we implement the selections. Uh, when I look at this selection base, I look at it as a capability of diversity, and therefore we will not only have diversity in systems, but also redundancy and competition as we move forward. Good morning. Julian Leek with America Space. Uh, this one's for Charlie, I believe. Uh, during the uh, CC Dev 2, Blue Origin was awarded $22 million. Uh, did they uh, submit a program for CCIP? Well, yeah, I'm going to let you ask that question in the next brief. I, okay. And I will tell you, I was not privy to know how many companies submitted who submitted, and I did not want to know. And I think, you know, when you talk about the integrity of the process, um, you know, I was briefed by Bill Gerstenmeyer day before yesterday on what was going to happen. I knew what the process was because we had gone over that over and over and over. Uh, so, you know, our, our, the Office of General Counsel, our procurement office, everybody was involved in this. So I don't know, uh, you know, whether they submitted or not, to be quite honest. I do know who the three winners were, so uh, uh, know that. Okay, but I, I would ask Bill Gerstenmeyer that question. I think he could answer it. Yes, sir. Uh, Chris Haber with Terrasang to Press. Uh, are you going to, uh, is Sierra Nevada planning on using any uh, KSC facilities? I'm going to let Bob address it because he talks to people all the time. Actually, uh, we have a Space Act agreement with Sierra Nevada, and eventually they do plan to use our facilities. We're working with them on what will will be when. Uh, not too long ago, uh, Sierra Nevada was here, and they had a uh, uh, jobs conference, if you will, and we're doing hiring uh, from the excellent workforce that we have here at the Cape. So uh, it's my great hope that, yes, in the future, if they move forward and ultimately are selected to uh, fly a cruise to the International Space Station, they'll be doing operations here at the Cape. And if I could follow that up. Uh, do you know about how many jobs are being created here in Florida by them and if they're using uh, any of the uh, retired uh, shuttle force? I don't have that number. Thank you. Uh, Colonel Cabana, just, just asking a similar question a little bit more broadly. We're just over a year uh, past the last shuttle flight. Um, could you just address you know, where KSC as a center stands now um, and how these announcements might impact the local workforce uh, and sort of the center's progression uh, in its transition. Absolutely, James. Uh, when I look back on where we were a year ago and where we are now, we have just made tremendous progress. I wish I could get everybody out to see all the changes that are happening here at the Kennedy Space Center. In a lot of areas, you know, you can't even see them all. Uh, they're down in the bowels of uh, the pad uh, within the MCC. It, it, Launch Control Center, it's everywhere. And, uh, you know, the team, I, I think we really have turned a corner. Uh, we're reaching stability and we're looking to uh, hire as we move forward. Uh, having the Orion vehicle here in the ONC High Bay now being built for its first flight in 2014. I mean, this is the first time we've built uh, human spacecraft here at the Kennedy Space Center in excellent partnership with the state of Florida. Um, and that's outstanding. The progress that has been made on the launch facilities out at the pad uh, in the VAB. We're starting work there now. The transporter, uh, crawler transporter number two is being totally refurbished to handle a heavier weight and to have another 20-year life on it. And uh, the team's doing a great job there. It's just multiple projects like this. And I think having, uh, getting to this next step in commercial crew, I mean, it, these two programs, I've said it before, I'll say it again, they're not mutually exclusive. Uh, they're extremely compatible, having a commercial capability along with NASA's exploration capability. Uh, this is our future, and we really do want to transform KSC into that 21st century launch complex of the future. We want to take what was science fiction and make it fact, and we're moving to make that happen. Uh, I think possibly again for Mr. Mango, could you just uh, explain a little bit the uh, the half award? Um, will that company accomplish half as much, or do they 
uh, benefit from uh, sharing a launch vehicle with one of the other um, competitors, or, or you know, what is the difference between a full and half award? See, uh, again, I would ask you ask that question in the next briefing because you'll see a, a lot more of the details. Um, I guess my quick answer is no one has a full award or a half award. We negotiated with these partners how much work we can get done in 21 months that seemed reasonable to us and fit into an overall budget profile. So that's how we figured out the partnership as a portfolio. Okay, there's no more questions. That concludes our briefing. Thank you. All right. Thank you Thank all you very all. much. Thanks for coming out. Thank you.